Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum podcast. I'm myself, Tom Kennedy, and my partner, Kevin Curley. Kevin, what is going on? How about those buffs? 102 yeah. points in a NCAA game. That's pretty strong. Yeah, I can't. Watching college basketball is impossible. I mean, you only need to turn on for the last minute. Uh, you know, they are up two minutes left, and <laughs> it was a shame. Not many upsets, though. But... Uh, no, a little chalky, but it's been a lot of fun anyway. Let's uh, let's jump into it. So we're going to talk about a topic that comes up quite a bit: uh, individual stock picking, technical analysis versus fundamental analysis, uh, some different strategies around it, and then we'll jump into a few articles, um, but something or nothing. So let's kick it off. Individual stock picking. What are your What are your thoughts? Where do you want to begin? Yeah, I want to start with. Um... Picking good stocks. Tom, I want to buy the good ones. How do I identify the good ones? Well, you know, even the good stocks go down, unfortunately, but there's 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 two different ways. We'll break it down. There's what's called fundamental analysis and, and technical analysis. So let's start with, with fundamental analysis and, and what it is. And fundamental analysis is, is what most people, shouldn't say most people, but w- are familiar with uh, for the most part. It's looking at professional investors like mutual fund managers, et cetera, typically are fundamental investors. Yeah, they're they're looking they're they're looking at the actual fundamentals of of the companies. They're looking at balance sheets, P and L's, um, different types of ratios, uh, P E ratios, valuations, and looking at stocks. You know, Warren Warren Buffett's a typical fundamental investor. He's looking for companies with good balance sheets that you think can grow over time. Um, and you do that by looking at uh, look, looking at the financials and, and the basics. And we can get into a, a couple of those. Um, you know, you hear a lot uh, on the media about this market being undervalued or overvalued. And that's really driven by fundamental analysis, looking at, you know, what, what the what the valuation is of the current market and, and the PE ratio. And I'll give you a, a quick example. So if you look at How do you explain what PE ratio is? So, so it's, it's, it's price over earnings. And, you know, there's 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 forward PE guidance. And, and right now, the look at the forward PE ratio of the overall market, it's right around 20. Um, the historic average is, is closer to 17 or 18. Uh, but that's only half the equation. The other is the earnings of these company stocks. So when you take a PE ratio of 20 and you times that by the average earnings, and I'm talking about the S&P of 245, 243 is where it's at, um, and those earnings are adjusted each quarter, that gives you an S&P of 5,064. And if you look where we're currently at in the S&P, it's 5,200. So again, a lot of people are thinking that this market is overvalued, just looking at, at basic basic fundamentals. So along the fundamental lines, Tom, uh, I do like the P.E. ratio. That's a good one to kind of a quick, hey, we're expensive or we cheap compared to history. Um, when you look at individual companies, I think one thing to consider is uh, high growth companies tend to have higher P.E. ratios. So one ratio I like to use is the peg ratio. So it's taking your P.E. ratio and divided by your growth rate. And that helps you figure out, am I paying a lot for this growth? or by just paying a lot for these earnings. And so if you have a company that's growing really quickly, you know, something like NVIDIA, you might see that they have a crazy high PE ratio, but when you divide it by their earnings rate, it might not seem as crazy as it once does. And so that's an example of using fundamental analysis. Uh, Within fundamental analysis, I think you can divide it into two camps, which one would be qualitative and would be quantitative. So we've hit pretty hard on the quantitative. Um, One step further than that is quantitative investing, which is just having a rules-based formula saying, This is what we identify as a good company. It has a certain amount of cash as reserves. It has a certain, uh, you know, gross margin or operating margin. It has grown. It pays a dividend, those kind of things. And you can filter companies to that quantitative analysis to determine which ones you should buy. Alternatively, qualitative, I think, are the ones that will say there's a lot of hope involved. 
Um, so this is a company that has a really good product and we think it's going to take off. Uh, or this one has a lot of market share and the market's growing at a faster rate than, you know, the average economy is growing. So those would be kind of qualitative things. And so qualitative tends to rely on something that's harder to find, which is manager skill. Uh, there is a measurement, which we can call alpha, uh, which is just basically trying to figure out how much better a manager did in excess of beta, which is just the general market. So if you have a mutual fund manager and they have a beta of one, uh, it likely means they're just tracking the index. So if you own an index fund, the beta should be around one. Uh, if it's not, uh, you probably have some questions about who's making that index. Uh, if you see a high alpha, that's typically a sign of a good manager, but doesn't always tell the full story. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. When, when looking at beta, if you have a, a fund that has a beta of two, well, that fund is expected to move twice as much as um, they're given the given respective uh, indice because it's going to, and that's both on the upside or downside. And to your point, ETFs have a beta of typically around one because it moves in line with, with whatever that indice is tracking. Um, and then alpha, to your point, is anything in excess return over that given over that given benchmark. But going going back to the individual stocks, um, there's another. There's another ratio that a lot look at, and that's earnings per share. Um, and when we hear these stories in the market about companies buying back their shares, you know, some will call that financial engineering. Because when you look at earnings per share, it's typically it's just the earnings of the company over the shares outstanding. Well, that can be kind of skewed because of because the only way to increase that number is to one have higher higher earnings, and earnings are earnings. You can't you can't uh, you can't wiggle that number. But what you can do is you can decrease the number of shares outstanding through buyback. So if you're buying back shares, well, the share count is less. So their earnings per share ratio is going to is going to go up. And that's a, a technique that's that's been around forever. Companies constantly buy back their shares and it's a way to help boost their stock price by having a higher earnings per share ratio, which is what a lot of fundamental investors uh, look at. Yeah, I think when you're trying to identify good stocks, one of the things that's hard to lie about is revenue. So if you start at the very top and go, are the revenues growing? That can be a sign of a company that's doing a little bit better. It's not always obvious because some of that growth can be inorganic, which they might just be buying other companies and that's how they're getting higher revenues. Some of it could be organic where they're, they're growing that. But as far as the balance sheet goes, what are some of the items that you can kind of we'll say it? is financial engineering versus what really can't be financial engineering. Yeah, so I think it, and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, asset managers out there, there's a lot of stra strategists out there that look at balance sheet and they just want companies that have a ton of cash on the balance sheet so they can withstand some downturns in the market and then also if you're looking at dividend paying strategies, if you want to invest in a stock that that pays a nice dividend and a high dividend, you want to look at the dividend cover ratio. How much money do they have to continue to pay uh, that that prospective dividend so um, you know I think that's a I think that's one that it doesn't lie you look at the balance sheet you can see how much cash you can see the revenue and that's pretty easy to, to take a look at um, when, when looking at, at, at some of these companies so Tom if I'm looking at the fundamentals of a company and I see it's a good company does that make it a good stock? No, and that's kind of and that will kind of lead to our, our, our second conversation about technical analysis. If 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 that's if that's how easy, it, I mean, anyone could do it. Then, if you're just looking at fundamentals, <laughs> it's easy to identify fundamentals of a company because you're looking at straight financials. Um, but as we all know, you can buy great companies with great balance sheets, great fundamentals on, on all the ratios, and we covered about three or four. And there's thousands of different ratios you can take a look at. But stocks still still can go down, and there's something called technical analysis, which is the complete opposite. What when you have a technician looking at technicals of a company or a fund or whatever it may be, they don't care at all what the companies do. They don't care what their objectives are. They don't care about balance sheets. They don't care about fundamentals. They're looking at price movement for the most part. And there's you know there's an ongoing debate and argument versus technical analysis versus fundamental, what's better? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to it, but technicals look at um, everything else. And it's basic, it, it, the easiest way is looking at price, you know, because people people think on the technical side that there are, there, there's, there's muscle memory, if you will, in, in, in price. 
Um, and there's price trends, there's chart patterns. So when you see all these different charts and um, these different moving averages, uh, support and resistant levels, that's technical analysis uh, 101. What are some examples of, we'll call it, um, so you, we, on the fundamental side, we talked about PE ratios, we talked about alpha and beta when it comes to managers. What are some of the keys somebody could look at if they were just starting out with technical analysis? You know, the, 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 the biggest one is what's called the 200-day moving average. The 200-day moving average versus the 50-day moving average. When the 50-day moving average goes past the 200-day moving average, uh, and this is just looking at the actual stock price, that price, that stock is has an upward momentum trend. And that cross point is called, actually called the, the, the golden cross. So typically technical analysis will say that once it passes that, then the wind's at your back and they follow momentum. They want to be buyers of that stock to take advantage of these, of what they think are our higher price points. And then there's, there's a floor and a ceiling or what they call you know support and resistance levels. And you'll see too, when we're looking at charts on stocks that if the stock's selling off, they'll typically retrace back to their prior high and there'll be some either buying or selling at that price point. And if it bounces off- well, To your point, the price has memory. It's just reading the people, right? So if you bought a stock and it went up or it was back to where you bought it, you might have some emotions tied to that number, regardless of whether it has anything to do with the quality of the company or really anything to do with whether or not you should hang on to it. But you said, I bought it at 60. And now it's at 55. I'm not going to sell it till it gets back to 60 or the reverse. It goes up to 70. You go, well, I'm only playing with gains. So I wouldn't sell it till it gets back down. Yeah. Right? And, and, and all, and all it is, is that there's more, yeah. all, all that does is it shows that there's more supply or demand out there at that given price point. So you see a lot of times we'll have media talk about, you know, the S and P, you know, hitting up to its all time high and it's either going to break out or break down, meaning that there's more sellers or buyers at that high point. And if there's more buyers, the stock, the, that index is going to continue to, to go up. If there's more sellers at that price point, um, typically the stock is going to, you know, there's less demand for it and, and it, it, the price should go down, but it's not an exact science. And there's, you know, there's fakes and there's a million different technical terms and, 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 and trends that you can follow. Um, so there's a little bit of an well, art to science to it. So what do you think of RSI, Tom, the relative strength indicator? Yeah, so typically what the RSI is, is if, if the RSI, it, it's it's zero to 100. If anything above 70, it means the that stock or index is overbought. Anything below 30 is that it, it's oversold. So these would be good, good indications of buying or selling points based on that. And if it stays in between, um, it's kind of neutral, if, if, if you will. Yeah, I think that's really helpful to maybe identify divergences. So one of the things that helps with that is it tries to measure the magnitude. So we've talked before and I've mentioned I like to look at volume. This volume can be a good indicator of big price moves. So when they have a uh, kind of a catalyst one way or another, positive or negative, uh, I think the RSI can be a great way to identify those divergences as well. So, you know, I, I wouldn't spend too much looking at seven or eight technical indicators. I would try to find your favorite two or three and keep it simple and kind of rely on those two things or three things. Uh, and on the fundamental side, I think one thing to review is just, do you want to buy companies that make money? Uh, you know, I think that if you look at how indexes are made or indices are made, some index funds like the Russell 2000, they'll throw anything in there. They'll throw in IPOs, they'll throw in SPACs, they'll throw in unprofitable companies, they'll have some profitable. Contrast that with like the S&P 600, which is a small cap index, but the rule is the company has to make money. Yep. Uh, that could be a simple one that you go, hey, does that work? And if you looked at some of the research from S&P, they would say, we think it works better over the long term because you have less major sell offs, you have less bankruptcies, less things go to zero. And they think in the long term that helps them have success. So when you're trying to identify good stocks or good stock indexes, uh, I think that having your own rules of do I want to buy companies that make profits? Because the other side is right now, those fundamental ones that you have to make money, they're underperforming the Russell 2000. So are you OK if you underperform because something like a SPAC that went public this week, you know, goes <laughs> into meme stock territory. And so now you're way behind. Yeah. You know, and I think when <clears throat> there's again, there's there's no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, most day traders are using technical analysis because it's quick. They don't care about the company and most long term investors are using fundamental analysis. But I think there's a way to combine 
the two, which is what we do. We're looking at good companies that we're going to focus on the long term, but where technical analysis can come in and be very useful is when to get into those type of companies, when to sell them. Because one of the things that you do want to do is have a risk management process in place. So when you invest in an individual stock or an ETF or whatever it may be, you also want to, you also want an exit point. Um, you want to buy, sell discipline. And that's where technical analysis can really help is entry points, both in and out of different ETFs, mutual funds, individual stocks. But you also want to combine that with buying just good, solid companies o- over the long term. Um, and everyone's strategy is different, but if you can combine both of those uh, two different processes, technical and fundamental analysis, I think over the long term, that's where you're gonna where you're gonna perform the best. Yeah, and I follow up by saying if you create that filter system where you say got to make money, got to do these things, it's got to check all these boxes before you buy it, that can help you stick with it. So if you believe in that company because you did your your analysis, whether it was technical or fundamental, where you were reviewing a mutual fund and said, okay, I figured out these are things that I want to see in a company or in a mutual fund, you're more likely to stick with it when it falls 10, 20, 30% than if you just kind of say, oh, I'm going to try to buy a bunch of things, see what goes up, I'll keep those and I'll sell the rest. Yeah, and then that, that's a good point too. And, and mutual funds, they're, they can be a great tool if you know exactly what you're buying because all these uh, portfolio managers that pick the individual stocks or bonds or whatever that mutual fund is holding, they have their own philosophy and process in place. And yeah, you can look at a mutual fund and look at the ratings and look at how well they've done. But if you don't truly understand the manager's buy and sell philosophy, the risk management process, how they're actually buying these individual stocks and bonds and investments, um, you're doing yourself a disservice. So that's something we spend a lot of time on when picking different mutual funds is Okay, well, I see what you own, but you know, when do you get out of stuff? When do you buy stuff? What's what's the process? Because at the end of the day, it comes down to risk management, and the really good ones will use a combination of the two. But it is mostly focused on fundamentals because that does that is, in my opinion, what does work long term. If I had to pick one of the two, it would be fundamental analysis because we want to buy good companies that are going to do well over the long term. And I think the key word there is process. So if you listen to Howard Marks or Cliff Asnes or some of the other very successful billionaire investors, even Warren Buffett, they have a process to identify which companies they're going to buy. So not just throw in darts at the dartboard, which has been proven that it can outperform in any given year. But over the long term, you have to have a process because otherwise you end up with results that don't make any sense. And you go, I made a ton of money on this company and not on the other one. I have no idea why. But if you have a process and you identify that, you kind of hone what you're looking for. I think you're more likely to have success in the long term. Yeah, yeah. And I think just getting a, a good understanding of it, be consistent, look for your top, you know, couple things that, that you want to identify. And there's a ton of research out there. I mean, Investopedia is a great site for just getting basic knowledge on what fundamental investing is, what's technical analysis. Um, and it can just help help your process, but it can get into the weeds and you can get really bogged down. And um, if technical analysis worked exactly as it, as it says, everyone would be, it, it, it wouldn't be a market. So it's not, a, yeah. it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not <laughs> an exact easy. science. You recognize a pattern and you'd hit that pattern every time. Yeah. Yeah. And some will say that they have this, you know, secret sauce to it and, and they don't even the best. No, I have the secret sauce. Call me Tom. Yeah. Even, even the best of the best, I know. The best of the best hedge have funds crystal have, ball behind have, have bad quarters. So, and bad years. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that the last comment I'd say is that there's going to be times that whatever your process is, is going to be in favor, but there's also going to be time that's out of favor. So that might be a time to sell, a time to buy. Uh, Working with an advisor to have a second opinion can be helpful. Working with any professional to evaluate what your process is for picking, quote, good stocks, I think is a good idea. So from that, let's move on to something or nothing and jump into some headlines. All right, Tom. So we got a headline in the Financial Times about a bond restructuring. One of our favorite countries we've discussed for the last couple of years, Zambia, is closing in on a default exit after its debt deal. They have agreed to have the creditors take anywhere from 16 to 22 uh, percent haircut on their bond holdings. And currently, Zambian bonds are trading at 74 cents on the dollar. Is this something or is this nothing? 
I, I think it's nothing. This happens all the time. It happens with countries. It happens with companies. Um, you know, they, they issue debt to get themselves out of a hole, uh, whatever the, that debt is used for. And sometimes they just don't have the revenue to pay it back. It's, it's used as a, a Band-Aid or a crutch to get them over for the next year, two years, whatever whatever amount of time they need. And sometimes they just don't make it. I mean, we, we hear about bankruptcies all the time. And uh that's that's never going away. So I don't I don't think it's something. Now, if you had defaults in some of the developed countries and and major countries, different story. I mean, the U.S. is uh, thirty three trillion dollars in debt. Um, <laughs> it, it that could be yeah. something, but uh, outside of the, the, the major <laughs> ones, uh, it, I think it's nothing. Yeah, I'd say the the specific example you can definitely dismiss and say it's a small country refinancing their debt, figuring it out. I think that part is nothing. I think the part that's something is to contrast against what we were just talking about, which is stocks, is there's a lot of hope involved and there's a chance that the company goes out of business. I mean, Zambia is definitely not an A-rated, high-quality investment when it comes to bond holdings, but you're looking at down 26% on your bonds and only taking a haircut between 16 and 22, assuming they don't default again. Uh, you're not losing your entire dollar there. You're only losing a quarter. So it's something that when you're evaluating fixed income compared to stocks, the bottom isn't necessarily zero. Now, some of the subordinated debt can definitely get wiped out, but senior debt, typically they settle and it's not going to be a zero on the balance sheet for your personal investments. Yeah, yeah. typically the, the junk bonds, which is, you know, triple B or, or, or lower, usually get about 60 to 66 percent or 60 to 60 cents back on your dollar um, if, if that company were, were to go were to go bankrupt because you're paid before common common shareholders and stock prices. So Yeah, yeah I think in 08, which is considered the worst market meltdown when it comes to debt, I think the recovery rates were still in the 40s. Yep. So that's the worst that's happened. You still got 40% back. So again, not a zero like a company going out of business, but fixed income is a very different animal. Uh, all right, Tom, next one, we had a commentary article from someone we like to reference, Edward Yardeni. He has Yardeni Research. You can find a lot of great charts on his website, as well as a lot of economic data. One question he asks is of the Fed. So if the economy is doing well with the current level rates, why lower them? So the question to you is, <laughs> is this question something? Is this a question nothing? Should the Fed be lowering rates? Should they not be lowering rates? If it's all working and we're puttering along, why raise? Why do it sounds like they found their R star? Yeah, it's uh, R star. That's funny. Um, yeah, I, I think that you is, know that is, I, right? I, I do. I do. Um, <laughs> okay. I just read Ben Bernanke's book, uh, 21st, uh, 21st Century Modern Day Policy, and it's unbelievable. Loves R star. Um, loves R star. But that is something. It, that is everything right now with what the Fed's going to do. You know, they're, the market's pricing in three cuts between now and the end of the year, but. There's a good chance they don't they don't cut at all. Um, they're they, they've been surprising markets not so much in the last 12 months, but they did with the, the massive hike. But I kind of agree with them. Why why raise rates? We've seen that the economy is is handle this high interest rate environment a lot better than we all thought. Now, if growth starts to fall, I don't think it has anything to do with inflation anymore, as much, I should say. It's all about growth. So if we start seeing unemployment rates really go up, um, you know, GDP growth coming down, that's going to be bad and, th and they will have to cut rates. But if growth remains where it's at and inflation is heading, even if inflation flatlines from here, I don't think they they don't need to cut rates. And there's they've even said it, there's bigger risk to cutting rates sooner than leaving rates higher for longer. And I think they're gonna I think they're gonna stand by that. And I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if we don't see a cut this year. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. And the, the big thing is that these interest rates, we've talked before about how they're a blunt instrument and they can take a long time to have an effect. So they have a lag effect. So waiting and seeing, do these high rates have an impact? It's only been about two years since they started raising rates. Now, and between the end of the year is when you really start to feel that. We have tremendous fiscal deficits, which might be kind of hiding the impact of some of these rates as far as the U.S. economy goes. But uh, I'd say, why not relax? See what happens. <laughs> no, we, and, uh, yeah, well, you, you mentioned the, the deficit. And we, we've said this the last couple of podcasts. I mean, $76 billion was the bill last month alone just for interest rate carry on the debt that the government has outstanding. So they're about to do $1 trillion, on pace to do $1 trillion this year just an in interest payment so they may have to raise rates just based on that or excuse me lower rates based on that alone 
All right, Tom, our third one, and we'll have one after this, which is what Texas can teach others about houses. So um, the, the article, the opinion article comes from John Byrne Murdoch, who I think is unrelated to the rest of the Murdoch family, but he writes for the Financial Times and he has an opinion article each week or column called uh, Data Points. And in there, he talks about how many of the liberal states like to crow about uh, affordable housing and all the things that they do for people who don't have as much. Uh, meanwhile, states like Texas don't spend much time talking about it. However, uh, Texas had in March 2023, construction began on 72,000 new homes in your area, Houston. Uh, and because of that, the price increases as far as real house price increases since 2000. So this is 20, 25 years of data. Uh, Austin, Houston, the other kind of Texas triangle country or cities, they're up 50 percent. Meanwhile, San Francisco and some of the kind of the, we'll call it the hotbeds of affordable housing conversation, those are up close to 150% since 2000. So he says and asks, well, is this something or is this nothing? It, you know, one does the walk and the other one does the talk. Which one's the better way to go? Fighting about affordable housing in your city councils and trying to identify rules? Or is it just build a lot of apartments? And if you just keep building, adding more supply, it solves the problem. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how to answer that one. That's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, housing housing is housing is a weird market because in that data you have the 2008. I mean, you can make the case that some of these cities just have more volatility in their housing prices, like San Francisco, where you had just the the boom in the tech companies in Silicon Valley. Um, you had look at Florida, how much that skyrocketed because of low tax rates and everyone moving there, and they were all crushed in 2008. Um, you can make the case that Texas has been Texas didn't feel as much pain in in the housing crisis, um, but they haven't also gone up and appreciated as much as as others. They've been a little bit less less volatile. And I don't I don't know what that's due to. Um, Texas right now is holding up really well and prices are continuing to go up because of the job creation. And I think at the end of the day, that's a big, big, big component of the housing prices, obviously, is, is, is jobs and, and where they're coming from and the amount of inventory that, that that's out there. And that constantly changes. So, you know, as you build more houses, the inventory uh, starts to go up and prices should 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 go down. But um, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's something. I think it's definitely something. And I think it has to do with development. And I also think it's a willingness to put apartments everywhere. If you drive through Houston, as you know, there is pretty much no rules. You can develop any type of property anywhere you want. Uh, now, it doesn't always fit right, but it's something you're allowed to do. But I think if you think about buying or building an apartment in Texas, it's pretty straightforward. The rules are pretty easy. If you try and do that in California, I've heard there's several hundred permits needed. You got to pay a lot of people. It can take years um, just to get the permits versus in Texas, considered business friendly. You can get that done in a few months and suddenly you have 70,000 new apartments online to deal with that demand of people coming for jobs like you mentioned. Yep. All right. So we got one last one and this is kind of a big one and kind of has to do with uh, really everything. But uh, there's something called the supplemental leverage ratio, which affects banks. Uh, but essentially what it is, is saying that on your balance sheet, if you're a bank and you hold U.S. Treasuries, uh, we're not going to count that against your leverage ratio anymore, which means they can lend more. And this is something that was submitted to U.S. agencies this year. Uh, and it seems something that they want to implement as quickly as possible. Uh, so, Tom, I, uh, I know this one's a little bit of a surprise, but, you know, is changing the rules of banking to increase how many loans they can make. Uh, something or nothing. Oh, I, I definitely think that's something. Um, I mean, you know, look at after 2008, they they implemented the the stress testing of these big banks and just being over levered because that's what called that was one of the root causes of t the, the the 2008 meltdown and having enough capital requirements on hand. Um, what's considered capital to meet that requirement? Um, and that's at the end of the day is going to determine how much they can lend because what we don't want is an over levered system again. So, um, you know, what happened last March, almost a year ago from today, was the that mini meltdown in the regional banks because of rates going up and their their capital that backed that all went down because it was held in fixed income security. So I think it is something, but I think it needs to be done. I think these banks constantly need to be reevaluated on how they're lending, what their practices are, their underwriting, all of that. So I think, I don't know if this is going to help or, or worsen it, but I think it, there's still structural issues that we don't even know about yet. Like we saw 
last year with the, with the, the high interest rates and the bonds losing so much value. That wasn't a, a foreseen event. And um, there's probably going to be others down the road. Yeah, I think this is definitely something. And it looks to me like this is two things. One is uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which failed almost exactly a year ago. Um, part of their issue was they had a bunch of U.S. Treasuries that were 20 and 30 years out as far as maturity, and they lost a tremendous amount of money. Now, if the Fed came in and said, oh, we'll just swap those Treasuries for ones at 100, or we'll buy those from you at 100, meaning take them out at par, uh, they solved the Silicon Bank problem. Uh, now, they've limited this policy to uh, just the kind of too big to fail, because uh, that's why they're too big to fail. We got to make sure they survive. So Silicon Valley likely still would have failed in this process, but they would at least have the tools to go and change it. And the second part is, to me, this is another way trying to juice economic growth is, look, we've got eight months to an election. What can we do since we can't get anything through Congress and they're fighting about that? Well, what if we change the rules of banking? What if we go through the Federal Reserve and ask them and have the uh, Treasury Secretary call them and say, hey, what if we didn't count treasuries against you? What if we said, uh, you know what, mortgage-backed securities, they, they're really helping the economy, et cetera. Uh, we're just not going to count those either. And so, OK, well, we can lend more. And so that can get that economic growth uh, at least steady and OK until November. And who knows what the rules become after that. Yep. Nope. I, I agree. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up. Uh, wrap it up there. Hopefully we uh, shared some good ideas on how to pick good individual stocks and we'll pick up in a couple of weeks. All right. Talk to you later, Tom. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.